Good morning. My name is Spencer Ante. I'm an uh, editor and writer at the Wall Street Journal. I oversee uh, wireless coverage and coverage of East Coast technology companies, so I'm delighted to be here this morning with our distinguished guest, Fred Wilson. Um, Fred has been one of the most active and prominent uh, venture capital investors in the New York venture uh, market for a long time. Um, he's also invested in some of the top mobile companies, uh, including Twitter, Foursquare, um, and many others. And I think we're going to talk for about 30 minutes, and I'm going to leave a few minutes for questions and answers at the end. But if anyone wants to send me uh, a question via Twitter at, uh, at spencerante.com, feel free to do that. So Fred. But that would be at Spencerante, right? Leave right. The, Sorry, leave at Spencerante, right, not dot .com. Do, do you own Spencerante.com? Uh, no, I don't. I don't. You should. I don't. I, don't. I, I, yeah, I should. I should. Someone's already, like, <laughs> taken it from me. Um, so Fred, you know, back in 2012, you wrote a pretty interesting blog post uh, where you said building an audience on the mobile space is a bitch. Yeah, it's Because hard. distribution is much harder on mobile. Uh, th than the uh, PC web, and we see a lot of startups having difficulties making that transition from successful product to to large, you know, large user base in real business. Right. So, you know, has anything changed in the last six months, or is that still true, or wh where do you stand on that? I think it's as hard as it's ever been. You know, uh, I don't know the exact numbers, and I'm sure that the Flurry folks do, but if you leave out games, which uh, I think is uh, a separate. Uh, uh, kind of uh, class of, of mobile apps, um, there probably aren't a hundred mobile apps, non-game mobile apps, that have aggregated more than 25 or 30 million users globally, right? And, and you know, the number of web applications that's, that see 25 to 30 million uh, unique visitors um, every month is probably 300, 400, 500. So I think that that shows you how much more difficult it is to get distribution on mobile. And part of it is that most of the distribution happens in the app stores. Um, and, they're, and they're pretty constrained experiences in terms of what one can do uh, in, 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 in getting distribution. And, and, you know, there's a lot of businesses that have gotten built over the years to try to make it easier. But the reality is, it's ex for developers, it's ex expensive. Um, and uh, challenging to to get people to download your app and use it on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So, what, what's the sort of the top advice you're giving startups right now if they come to you uh, and they're trying to build a mobile business? Do you tell them to go mobile first or mobile exclusive, or what do you or, or I think, hedge your bets? Look, I think you have to be on mobile because I think that's the future. And uh, more and more of our time every day is being spent on a mobile device as opposed to a desktop device. And, uh, and, and the, uh, the engagement on the mobile device is, is more sustained uh, throughout the day as opposed to discrete periods of time when we're in front of a desktop device. And it really feels like a lot of, uh, of what we would consider to be media or attention uh, is moving more and more towards mobile. So I think you have to be there. And the question is, what do you do in order to build a, a meaningful user base on mobile? The things that have worked best um, are those services that um, you join because your friends are on it. Um, and so a great example of that are the mobile messenger applications. Right? And there are probably a dozen or more around the world that have amassed, um, you know, user bases in, in excess of uh, 20 or 30 million users. What's that? Kick all that? All yeah, those. I mean, well, so you have iMessage, um, you've got um, Facebook Messenger, you have WhatsApp, you have Kick, you have Line, um, and then there's all of these services in Asia um, that essentially are do the same thing, um, and probably another half a dozen that that exist in Asia. And the reason that, and, and, and none of them spend any money on um, distribution, but the reason that they grow is that um, you got a, if you have a friend on the app, you get on the app, so you can talk to them. And Snapchat's another example. People think of Snapchat as a, as a photo application, but I think it's really more of a messenger application. So that's an example of a behavior dynamic that um, 
leverages uh, the social aspect of the service to create distribution automatically. And, and, and services like Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and Tumblr, the big social platforms um, also leverage that. But if you're you know, an e-commerce company, mm -hmm. um, then it's more challenging right. because the fact that you know, your friend is, is using um, you know, Etsy app to buy stuff on their phone is really not much of an incentive for you. So, so when you move outside uh, communication and social, it, it starts to get very difficult. Right. I, I want to really dig into this whole mobile uh, consumer um, space, but I, you know, given the events of the last week or so with these extraordinary revelations about um, government spying programs, government surveillance programs, I think I, I need to ask you about that because a lot of people are uh, wondering or asking, you know, is that going to have an impact on the technology industry? Because um, so much of the technology industry, and especially mobile, which is a very personal uh, platform, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're giving over all information, and you know, we're trusting these companies to protect it. You know, what 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 do you think about this? Is this going to have a negative impact on the industry, or is it just going to sort of blow over? Well, the place I would worry about it the most is mobile and internet users outside the United States using services that are domiciled in the United States, and there are many, Google, Apple, Facebook, Twitter, Microsoft, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, and, you know, if you're a, a German or you're a, you know, you live in India or you live in Turkey or something, the idea that, you know, the, the U.S. government is spying on your activities through U.S. domiciled uh, companies who are, you know, in partnership with uh, the U.S. government, uh, either uh, by choice or not by choice. I mean, when the government shows up with a, with a letter and says, you know, you're required to give us this information, it's kind of hard to say no. Um, so that's, that's a big concern, and I think that, that the, uh, I would hope that the people who worry about business interests in our government are fighting with the people who worry about national security interests um, and having a debate about you know this specific issue because look if 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 Western Europeans stop using Dropbox because they're afraid that the U.S. government is you know able to see everything they put in their Dropbox and they start using some service that's based in you know Iceland or or Sweden or, or Germany or France or something like that, that's going to be really bad for Dropbox. And, and it wouldn't surprise me that some of that will happen. Um, how much of it, I think, is a bigger question, right? So everybody is upset about this at some level, or, or many people are upset about this at some level, but the question is whether people will change their behavior. We have a company in our portfolio called DuckDuckGo. It's kind of a weird name and you know, probably could use some help from all these marketers in the audience in terms of branding. <laughs> but what DuckDuckGo is, it is, a, is it an entirely private search engine. So it's a competitor to Google um, and they make a promise that they don't save your search history. They don't bubble you. They don't target any ads based on your search history. It's entirely private. Um, and uh, I'll get quickly, this is not an advertisement for DuckDuckGo. Um, if the government were to show up with a national security letter, they would not be able to provide any information because they have no information. That's, that is the way they operate their business. DuckDuckGo's use, usage has gone, grown by 50% in the past week. Uh, it's gone from about uh, a million eight searches a day to about two and a half million searches a day. Um, so there is some activity. Yeah. There is some change of behavior. But that's not that much, right? I mean, Google probably processes two, two and a half million searches every second. I don't know. I really don't know. But it's so, you know, the number of people who really, really care about this enough to change their the search engine they use isn't that much. And so one wonders whether we're all, you know, talking about it but not really doing anything about it. Right. Okay. So back to business. Um, you mentioned one of the big challenges with mobile is developing these large user bases, and I, I would agree with that. I also think that the other big question in the industry right now is, you know, there's tremendous usage shifting to mobile. Right. Um, you know, the device, you know, the, there's some, you know, you shared a presentation with me that which you should all look at if you haven't seen it called Mobile's Eating the World, which is a play on the uh, Mark Andreessen uh, story, software is eating the world, and there were 1.6 billion PCs in use last year compared to 3.2 billion mobile users. So there's twice as many mobile users as PC users, and that gap is growing. Right. So clearly, 
mobile is eating the world. But can these companies develop substantial businesses? Uh, I, there's, I th I've seen few examples of mobile only companies that have developed substantial businesses. Most of the um, uh, successes have been around acquisitions of companies that have developed large user bases that have did not monetize yet. So what's, what's your view on that? Well, I think if we go back to the early days of the internet and you look at, uh, say, 95 to 2000, and you look at web, a lot of the early web companies struggled to monetize. And it wasn't really till things like uh, paid search came along, um, self-serve display ad networks came along, um, where e-commerce became much more easy to do on the web. People became much more willing to uh, uh, take out their credit card and do transactions on the internet. Um, when all of those things started to happen, it started to become possible to, to really um, build scalable businesses on, on the desktop web. And, and maybe you know, it took a decade, really, for that to happen. Um, today, I think everybody understands you can build very large businesses on the web, and the question about how you monetize on the web is, is largely um, uh, you know, yesterday's conversation. And I think the same thing is true uh, on mobile. And um, I, I think we, we're seeing a lot of activity in mobile commerce. So uh, eBay, I think, is maybe the, the, the poster child in that regard. I don't have the numbers at my fingertips, but they have a massive business on mobile now. Um, and uh, also uh, games. Uh, I, I saw a tweet uh, uh, in the past couple of days from a guy I know in the gaming business who said that upwards of 90% of the commerce that happens in the iTunes app store is games related. And that may be wrong. That's a tweet, so and take it for what it's worth. But e even if it were 50 or 60%, that would be an enormous number. So clearly, mobile games is a massive business. And so I think it is certainly true that people are making a lot of money on mobile. I think it's harder for somebody like an Instagram or a Snapchat uh, to execute a business model than it is for an eBay or a Candy Crush. But I have, I have a lot of confidence that they can if they have the patience to do it. It may just be easier for Instagram to sell to uh, uh, Facebook for a billion dollars and be done with it, or ways to sell to Google for a billion three and be done with it. And that's certainly one way to monetize. But ultimately, I think there will be entrepreneurs who will stick it out um, and, and, and prove that you can monetize uh, pretty much any large mobile audience if you, if you want to work at it. You know, there was an interesting uh, press release that came out this morning from eMarketer on the mobile advertising, not the latest mobile advertising numbers. Uh, it showed that um, the one thing that uh, struck me was that there seems to be much more concentration of advertising revenue in mobile than in PC. So Google is dominating mobile advertising right now. It's 53% share of the mobile ad market compared to 32% of the overall digital ad market. So you know, is mobile advertising going to be more of a winner-take-all market than PC advertising, or is that going to change over time because if it if it is that has huge implications for all these other little companies that are trying to build businesses well i i think um we need to continue to innovate in mobile advertising i i don't think that we've necessarily gotten to um good ad formats and i don't think that we've necessarily gotten uh yet to good ad placement and, um, and I don't think we've necessarily gotten to good ad targeting. So, you know, what's going on today feels a lot like what was going on with display advertising in the early days of the desktop web where, you know, people were just putting kind of ugly banners out there and kind of rubbing it in your face. And I get very annoyed when, you know, I'm using a mobile app and down at the bottom of the app is like a little banner that's kind of dancing around, and it's actually covering buttons that I need to actually get to. It's like a, a dancing GIF from 1998. Exactly. It's the same <laughs> damn thing. Um, so we've got to fix that. And, uh, you know, look, you know, Fleury, who's, this, who's you know, put this, this uh, event together, you know, is a portfolio company of ours. I don't want to uh, be out promoting too much, but, but they have some interesting uh, technology and some interesting solutions for that, and so do many other companies. Um, and so I think that uh, the other thing that uh, we can start to see happening is what's happening 
in these um, uh, social apps, what's happening in Facebook and what's happening in Twitter, where you're seeing um, the ad unit I think Twitter is, is a really good example of this, where the tweet is the ad unit, um, and the promoted tweet just shows up in your timeline, and it feels like it belongs there. I mean, anybody can argue that advertising, they'd rather not have the ad there, but in the grand scheme of things, a promoted tweet in your timeline when it's well-targeted does feel like a pretty good execution of advertising in mobile. Facebook's getting better in terms of using uh, advertising in their mobile timelines as well. So I, I think, you know, we're maybe, you know, uh, depending on what category games, we're probably 70 to 80 percent of the way there and figuring it out. Commerce, maybe 50 percent of the way towards figuring it out. And maybe in media, we're 20 to 30 percent of the way figuring out. But I, I feel pretty confident that we're making lots of progress. Yeah. You know, you mentioned the Google Waze acquisition, uh, which I found very interesting given that there was so much, uh, you know, there was a lot of people that right. were taking a look at that company. I, I thought Apple it, it was going to buy it at one point. Um, given Google's dominance in mobile advertising and in mapping in particular, right. do you think that that transaction is going to get a lot of scrutiny from the government? I, I don't know. Um, you know, there are other large mapping platforms out there that, um, you know, Microsoft has a big maps platform. Nokia has a big maps platform. Um, Apple is developing a big, big, big map, maps platform. So, um, you know, there are competitors. Um, it is true. I think probably every person in this audience would, would probably say that Google's maps are the best and they're the ones that we tend to use. Google's dominance in maps feels a lot like their dominance in search. So, um, you know, I think Waze makes them that much better. And, and it also adds something that I think is the next move in mapping, which is the insertion of um, our self-reported data into maps. And traffic is obviously you know, a huge opportunity for self-reporting and also a huge pain point. You know, when you're stuck in traffic, that's like, you got to know how to get out of it, right? So that makes a lot of sense. But there are, you know, we have a company, Foursquare, in our portfolio that has 12 million people around the world every month um, contributing data about what they're doing um, into a map-like format. And so the idea that um, personal power, people-powered data is going to show up inside maps um, is inevitable in my mind. And if Google runs the table on that, they're going to become even more dominant. And I think what that means is that companies like Apple and, and Microsoft and Nokia are going to have to get more aggressive. Um, they have to make bigger investments in their mapping business, and they're going to have to get more acquisitive. You know, for, you mentioned Foursquare. Foursquare is obviously one of the most prominent uh, mobile companies and definitely most prominent New York companies. Um, you've been an early investor in Foursquare. Right. They've had a lot of, uh, you know, there's been a lot of commentary around Foursquare in the last year. You know, they're trying to make that difficult shift from product to business. Right. Um, How's it going this year? Is the monetization the, picking up? Monetization is going great, but the ch the challenge that they're having is not actually, in my mind, uh, not going from product to monetization. That they're doing very well on. It's a service that monetizes very naturally. When you know somebody is somewhere, it's very easy to hit them with a message that's highly relevant and highly targeted. So their ad performance is, 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 is great. The challenge that they're having is going from a service that um, is niche which is check-in, mm -hmm. to a service which is mass, which is maps with people in it. And uh, I think that they have done a poor job, if I could be critical uh, publicly of them, in... Um, Go ahead, please do. <laughs> they've done a poor job of articulating that change. Um, so maybe 10% of us want to self-report where we are by checking into a service like Foursquare. Um, I think 100% of us would love to know when we sit down to dinner that uh, your friend Spencer said, you know, get the XYZ appetizer. It's amazing, right? And so Twitter had this problem in the early days where um, not that many people wanted to tweet, right? But everybody, it turned out, was interested in reading tweets, particularly from people they were interested in. So Twitter p pivoted in some ways the way they talked about the service and in some ways the way the product worked from being about tweeting 
to be about following. And Foursquare has done it on a product basis, changed the service from being about checking in to being a service about maps with people that you care about in it. But they haven't done a very good job of telling the world that that's what they actually are. And as a result, I think a lot of people still think of them as that app that you check in when you know that's actually pretty niche behavior. So that, that I think, is their challenge. Okay. Uh, Twitter, uh, you know, by contrast, uh, from what we can tell, is, is monetizing like crazy right now. Uh, mm -hmm. It's generating significant hundreds of million dollars in revenue from advertising. You've been involved with Twitter from the very early days. You know, what, what's the big takeaway from that? What, what did they crack? Uh, and what, what lessons does that um, give to other people in the room uh, about the sort of future of, you know, mobile media and mobile advertising? I think when I think about Twitter, the three big things that I think about are um, follower instead of friend, um, default public instead of default private, and open data versus closed data. And those three things seem small, but they're huge in the context of Twitter. So, uh, you know, if I want to follow you on Twitter, you don't have to agree, right? I just get to follow you, right? So. It's a, it's a much more scalable model. Um, and, and for brands, I think in particular. Instead of a friending model, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Right? And for brands in particular, the notion that I'm going to friend a brand doesn't make any sense. But the notion that I'm going to follow a brand makes all the sense in the world. So the follower model, uh, I think, is a much more scalable model than the friending model. Default public as opposed to default private is also huge because 99.99% .99 of the data that's inside Twitter is public. and so. You want to uh, read your tweets, you go to twitter.com slash spencerante, and you don't have to sign in, you don't have to do anything. There it is. Boom. I see it. And then the third thing is that they publish their data via the API. So for example, entrepreneurs have built all these companies, these dashboard companies, and they've taken it to you know, brands, they've taken it to TV, they've taken it to lots of markets, and, and they've ha had third parties now build industries for them. Twitter's huge in social TV. Tune in, driving tune in. Twitter didn't make that happen. All these entrepreneurs who built social TV businesses on top of the Twitter platform made that happen. Um, but Twitter benefits from that uh, enormously. And nobody really uses Facebook for social TV. They all use Twitter for social TV. It's because Twitter's follow, not friend, default public, not default private, and open data versus closed data. And I think that's why Twitter is so successful. Do you think Facebook is uh, can sort of transition or, or transform itself into more of a open they're public, trying. publishing they, platform? They're, they're trying. They, they announced something yesterday. I didn't really spend a lot of time looking at it. But uh, there's some new service that they've launched that feels a lot more like Twitter. And they have hashtags now, which hashtags is, now. yeah, that tells you a lot. Uh, it's just hard, right? I mean, you are what you are to, uh, you know, this is the challenge that, that Foursquare has, right? So. Um, uh, Changing the market's perception of what you are uh, is hard. And uh, Twitter hasn't had to do that, and Facebook has to do that. So that's why I think it's hard for them. Uh, I got to ask you about uh, Tumblr, because uh, you know, in the New York technology market, the Tumblr Yahoo acquisition was probably the biggest news of the year, I would say, so far. Um, you also sold, um, you were an investor in GeoCities yeah. many years. Where would you be without Yahoo, Fred? <laughs> I'd probably own one house instead of four. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So ne um, ne never let it be said that I don't tell the truth. <laughs> I appreciate that. Right, thank um, you. Um, but the real question is, you know, obviously GeoCities uh, is perceived mostly to be a failed acquisition for right. Yahoo, and they never really capitalized on it. Um, some people have said that they see a similar outcome for Tumblr. Yeah. Do you agree with that or not? No, I don't. Um, but I but I understand where that comes from, and I think it, it's 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 certainly an intelligent way to think about it. Uh, GeoCities and Tumblr uh, plug into the same need. Uh, GeoCities did it circa 1995. Tumblr does it circa 2007, 2008. Um, but it is the need for self-expression, right? And an easy self-expression. So getting a WordPress blog and getting you know, fredwilson.com and domain mapping it and, and putting a bunch of content on it uh, is hard. And Tumblr made it really, really simple. And so did GeoCities. But in GeoCities, they, 
the notion of a blog didn't exist. It was personal home pages, and, and GeoCities was the place that people went to the net, went on the net to create their place on the internet where they express themselves, and this is my home page. Now it's, it's a Tumblog. Um, and so they come from the same place. The difference is that with both GeoCities and MySpace, there was no central organization system for all of this social activity. And Facebook's innovation was the news feed. And we see that with Twitter. And Tumblr also has one called the Dashboard. So uh, most of Tumblr's page views are actually in the Dashboard. Even though people can pimp out their Tumblogs however they want them, most of the activity is in a very you know, uh, nicely constructed, clean, well-lit, uh, environment where marketers can engage and Tumblr has built, uh, I think actually, maybe the most elegant native advertising platform of them all, which is, hey marketer, Mr. Marketer, Mrs. Marketer, um, Ms. Marketer, build a blog and, um, and then the posts that you think um, you really want the world to see, you can promote. And you can do it in mobile, right? So the, the mobile dashboard is really nice. And if, you know, if you're Nike and you have some new shoe that you want to promote, you put it in your Tumblog, you promote it to the dashboard, and, and I'm there on my phone, and I see it, boom, look at it. So I think Yahoo will do great with Tumblr. Um, I really do. I'm not just saying that to uh, you know, talk my own book. Um, I really think that they have um, a powerful social system that continues to grow like a weed that has a native monetization system built in that's emerging, starting to actually produce a fair amount of revenue, and Yahoo can throw the energy of its very large sales force at that, and I think they'll do very well with it. Did, did you have any, is it like a bittersweet thing for you that you think that maybe you should have not sold the company, or it could have become a much bigger company down the road? Facebook famously turned down a billion yeah. dollars from Yahoo. Yeah. That turned out to be a good move. Twitter turned down a half a billion from Facebook, and that turned out to be a good move. Um, it comes down to the entrepreneurs. We in the venture business need to be in the business of supporting what the entrepreneurs and their management teams want to do with their companies. We shouldn't block a transaction when the founders and the team want to sell, and we shouldn't force a sale when they don't want to sell. Unless the company is failing and is going to go out of business, then I think it's incumbent on us to knock some sense into people. But when you sell your company for a billion one, it's not like you were going to go out of business. Uh, in the case of Tumblr, it was the right choice for David, and it was the right choice for the team. And so uh, it's, it's the right choice for the investors, by definition. OK. Uh, I got a, I got a uh, question from Tom Hammer via Twitter, who uh, actually brings up a good topic, which is speak to mobile video and the capabilities of dynamic live stream insertion, uh, i.e. the ESPN Twitter deal. Um, is that, is that going to be a big part of mobile advertising, do you think? Yeah, I think so. Um, the, the trick with video on mobile is short is, is sweet. Uh, I think the success of Vine shows that, and the success of YouTube shows that. Um, it, it's, I'm sure that we will watch Netflix and other streaming services on our phones, but the thing that seems to work really, really well is you know, the dunk of the day, right? The ESPN, you know, 30 seconds or the soccer goals or things like that, things that are quick hits where everybody wants to see them and you get in, you get out. Um, and so I'm very bullish on that. It's a BuzzFeed world. We just live exactly. in it, right? It is. Well, you know, uh, yes, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, another, another uh, big issue in this industry is the whole mobile ecosystem battle between um, you know, all these giant companies. Obviously, Google with Android and Apple with iOS have sort of emerged as you know, the, the leading players. They have more or less a duopoly. Right. Um, but there still is hope of a third ecosystem, yeah, among some people anyway. Um, do you think that's a viable thing, or is it just going to sort of continue to be a duopoly? It's hard because when you talk to developers, developing for two platforms is really hard. And you really kind of have to develop for three. You have to develop for the web, you have to develop for iOS, and you have to develop for Android. And so to move your applications through multiple iterations across three platforms, I mean, that, that is the single big change that's happened to the technology companies we work with in the past five years is they used to have a very simple world they operated in. They iterated on the web, and that was it. Now they have to iterate on three platforms, each of which has its unique strengths and weaknesses. And they have to do that, ideally, 
um, in sync, so they're moving their, their business forward. And that's really, really hard. And to get anybody to think about a fourth, um, it's just, you know, and, and Windows probably, you know, is the fourth. Um, but very few of our companies are building to Windows. I'd say it's maybe a third of, the, of our mobile companies with mobile apps are developing for Windows, mm -hmm. um, whereas two-thirds are developing for both iOS and Android, or maybe even three-quarters are developing for both iOS and Android. So uh, that's what's going to work against a, a third. Now, if we get to HTML5 and move away from native apps, um, which I don't see happening anytime soon, then that changes everything. And that's why I think you see things like Firefox OS and Tizen, which is Samsung's you know, alternative to Android, um, le uh, and you know, uh, Palm's web OS, uh, which you know, is largely come and gone, uh, leveraging HTML5 yep. natively in their operating systems. That seems like the answer, but I don't think we're, we're getting there today or tomorrow. And you know, we may, we, it's possible we may never get there, yep. but we're certainly not getting there anytime soon. So we got a few more minutes left. Does anyone want to ask a question? Hey, Fred. Uh, Richard from uh, Flurry. I run the European bit. Um, King announced uh, they were removing ads from all of their games this week. Um, do you agree with that? Do you think they've made the right decision? And then how does, does that impact how you advise developers as to whether to put ads in? And is there a situation where you advise them not to put ads in, or at a certain stage of growth, or a certain sector or vertical? But I guess my first question is the most important is, do you agree and they made the right decision? Well, I think it's easier if you're a game developer, right? Because uh, the in-app upgrade, the virtual currency, being able to level up in a game, you know, building that um, uh, ability to get to the next level uh, through both pay or perform gives the mobile game developer uh, the ability to think about taking ads out of their game. Um, they have an alternative. And, and, uh, and I think you know, I could I could make an argument as why that's a good choice for a mobile game developer. The the only thing that I think is is potentially a mistake is that um, games games sort of are come and go business. So pretty much every game has a life a cycle. Some games it's longer than others, but but they come and they go. And so I do think it's I think if I was uh, running that business, I would want to keep some notion of a a a some real estate in the game for promotion and probably just promoting other games, um, my own games or possibly other people's games who, uh, because um, the, the, the game players, I think, do actually appreciate that. And I think there's particular uh, good places inside games to do that kind of thing. So uh, I, I understand why they did it, and they certainly have the luxury of being able to do it. But I, I do think um, cross-promotion of games uh, is an area that most game developers should probably stay in. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody.